Well, thank you, everyone. Welcome to this quick quake briefing, the last one for this year, uh, which is on the Philippines earthquake this past July. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Angel. I'm ERI's communications and program manager. And before I turn it over uh, to the host of the webinar today, I just want to say a few quick words about ERI. The Earthquake Engineering Research Institute is the leading nonprofit organization dedicated to understanding earthquake risk and, and um, increasing earthquake resilience in communities around the world. And we've been bringing people together from a wide range of disciplines working in this field uh, for well over half a century now. And I just want to mention for those of you who are members, it's renewal season. And if you're not already a member, uh, you can learn about some of the benefits of EER membership and join us at this address here. Some of those benefits include the Pulse newsletter twice a month, full access to all the contents of our peer-reviewed journal, Earthquake Spectra, discount registrations to our meetings and conferences, and much more. And on the subject of meetings, I also just want to mention that, uh, as we announced today, the 2023 annual meeting will be in San Francisco, California, uh, in April from the 11th to the 14th. Uh, so we'll be sharing more information about that soon, but we hope you'll be joining us. Uh, it's going to be a great event. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Volkan Sevilgen, who's the chapter president for ERI's um, Northern California Regional Chapter, which is hosting today's webinar. Volkan? Thank you, Elizabeth. I would like to welcome everyone for the fantastic group of presentations. At the end of the presentations, I will be asking questions to our wonderful speakers. And if you add your question into the Q&A option in Zoom, I would be able to ask these questions to our uh, speakers. And then uh, I will have follow-ups on those questions as well. To introduce the speakers, I would like to hand the virtual microphone to Bruce Mason. Bruce? Thank you. Thank you, Volcan. I want to welcome everybody to our briefing on the magnitude seven earthquake that occurred in July in the Philippines. My name is Bruce Mason. I'm the secretary for the Northern uh, California Regional Chapter. This is our sixth and final quick quake briefing for this year. All of our previous briefings have been recorded and they're available for future viewing on YouTube. What you do is you go into YouTube and just type in quick quake briefing and the playlist will come up and you can select which ones you wish to view. Now, our briefings are free and they're open to the public. Anyone can view them. If you're a member of EERI, then you get notifications and we urge you to consider joining our organization. But if you're not and you want to get onto our mailing list, send me a note and I'll put you on the mailing list so that you're able to get announcements of our future briefings. Now, before we get started, I wanna mention our next plan briefing. And this one will deal with the magnitude 5.6 earthquake that struck in Indonesia just last week. It caused widespread damage and it killed over 300 people. So this, we will uh, establish a briefing on this after we know more about what happened in this event. So perhaps we'll have it in late January or likely in February. So please stay tuned. Okay, now on to today's briefing. On July 27th, there was a magnitude seven struck on, struck on Lusan Island in the Northern Philippines. Lusan Island is one of the most hazard prone regions on earth for it has experienced 11 magnitude 6.5 or greater earthquakes since 1970. The July quake caused much damage and it was felt over a wide area. It was felt as far away as Manila, the capital of the Philippines, some 250 miles away to the south. Now the YouTube video we sent with our announcement showed the violent shaking as well as the dramatic human response to the during the earthquake. We can expect to have the same responses here in California should we suffer a similar intensity earthquake. We are excited to have two speakers from the Philippines joining us today. 
The first will be talking about the seismology of the region, as well as the particulars with regard to the earthquake that occurred. And our second speaker will talk about observed building damage. Now, here is our format. Our program today is about 60 minutes. Each speaker will talk for about 20 minutes. And then the rest of our time will be for the question and answer period. We encourage questions from you, the audience. And as Vulcan mentioned, how you will do that is you hit the Q&A button, type in your question. He will go through the questions and he will come back later in our program and pose the questions to our speakers. Now we recognize that we might have more questions than time permits. So both of our speakers today have kindly provided their email addresses and you see them on the screen here. And if you, so you can communicate with them directly and in the coming days, they will try to, to answer your questions. Now, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce our first speaker. And that's a Dr. Mario Arillo. He is a professor at the University of the Philippines. He is in a natu the Natural Institute of Geological Sciences. Mario will explain the seismology of the region as well as the particulars of the earthquake that just occurred. Mario, could you please proceed? Yes, um, thank you, Bruce, and thank you everyone for for joining uh, this uh, ERI quick, quick briefing. It's not really very quick because the earthquake took place in July and there was another earthquake already um, on October 25. That means less than three months after the July earthquake. That's why uh, with your indulgence, I have uh, modified my presentation, the title itself, uh, because here you now see that it is also including, it will also include, um, sorry for that, I'll just move away one of the slides, which is blocking the screen, uh, I guess two of them, sorry for that. And, um, and so uh, that's why uh, the title appears that way. Um, let me see, sorry. Too, too, too many screens. Okay, in any case, um, so my presentation is about um, the two earthquakes, but I'll focus on the bigger one, the July 7th, uh, July 27th earthquake. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, people who have uh, contributed in, in um, sorry, I'm losing my cursor. In um, in doing this work, um, three of them are my faculty, uh, co-faculty at the university, and then that's uh, Sandra, Alec, and John Dale. Also, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Mahar Lagmay, who is the executive director of the University of the Philippines um, uh, Resilience Institute, and finally my niece uh, Cheska Aurelio, who is a member of the an associate member of the Association of Structural Engineers of the Philippines, based in uh, Northern Philippines, as we call it, the Locos region. Um, and so, this presentation I think um, emanated from an article that we wrote for Temblor um, a few weeks after the earthquake on July 27, the magnitude seven earthquake, and somehow it was picked up by our colleagues at Temblor and because I think Temblor and um, EERI are very tightly connected to each other, given the specializations of those who are at Temblor as well as the uh, type of um, professions, um, professionals in the membership of ERI. And so I'd like to express our gratitude actually to Temblor and ERI for the invitation. 
Um, just take note that I will be talking, as uh, Bruce mentioned, more on the geology and the seismology of the earthquake, but not only on the magnitude 7 earthquake, but also with the magnitude 6.4 earthquake on July on October 25, uh, less than three months after the first big quake. So, yeah, um, I'm assuming that uh, some of the attendees are not maybe very familiar with uh, Philippine tectonics. So I'll just say a few words about it um, to serve as an introduction. Uh, you see, the Philippines is surrounded by at least six active trenches. And the FIVOLS, the Philippine Institute of Seismology and Volcanology, have identified about 220 active faults. So, um, and, but the biggest of them would be the Philippine fault that goes right through the middle and all the way from the north to the south of the Philippines, about 1,200 kilometers long, uh, almost the same distance or length as your San Andreas fault in California. And this gives rise to a seismicity, um, which is um, very obvious in this map. Uh, the entire Philippine archipelago, with the exception perhaps of an island to the west we call Palawan, is really prone to earthquakes. And uh, historically, there have been, uh, I should say, more than two dozen earthquakes of magnitude 7 already in the last 100 years or so. Most of them concentrated along um, the Philippine Fault as well as on the trenches. Let's focus our attention in this discussion. I'll focus my attention or my discussions on the two earthquakes that took place um, less than three months apart, starting with the magnitude 7 earthquake on July 27, followed by the October 25 earthquake. Uh, magnitude 6.3. Uh, take note that in that place, um, similar, which is um, this, which is of the same scenario as what you might see in other parts of the country, Central Philippines and even the Southern Philippines, um, based on GPS readings that uh, have been conducted since the late uh, 1990s or mid 1990s, we are measuring about five to six centimeters per year of relative motion on the blocks in the Philippines, especially in northern Luzon. And um, about 20 or 30 percent of that, so that's about between one and three centimeters per year, is accommodated along the Philippine Fault or its branches. Um, the San Andreas Fault, if I remember right, is moving at a rate of about 1.2 centimeters per year. So the Philippine Fault moves uh, um, at that rate or even twice uh, that rate, depending on which branch um, is moving. So uh, let me just show um, a few slides, but uh, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Garciano will explain in more detail the type of damage, infrastructure damage that was sustained by many of the buildings and infrastructure in Abra. But you see very common among them is uh, our flattened buildings uh, with very heavy second and third floors and perhaps uh, structurally weak uh, first floor. You see here, for example, in this photograph over here where my cursor is, you're looking at uh, actually the second floor already hugging the ground. And uh, there's a close up of um, a vehicle parked underneath, uh, which is already almost completely flattened. For the houses, so this is for houses uh, that you might find in, let's say, the city proper, but in houses in the, in the mountainous areas, in the villages, far flung villages, um, there's rarely, you can rarely find any building that is, shall we say, engineered. And so you'd see very common a collapse of walls and collapse of beams and um, other walls. Uh, as well, as far as horizontal structures are concerned, like roads, uh, this is the type of damage um, that we encountered or we observed. Uh, many landslides um, blocking off uh, highways, for example, but also fissures uh, along the ground, uh, on, on the flatter grounds. Uh, Many, uh, at least five of them, I visited the historical churches, heritage churches built in the 17th, uh, 1800s, um, sustaining damage. And you see here on the right hand side how the people coped. Um, and this lasted for maybe two, three weeks after the main shock. Uh, most of the residents uh, whose houses were affected were um, um, still scared um, even after two weeks or three weeks because aftershocks were, were still going on. Um, so 
really the key here is um, for a geologist, the magnitude 7 earthquake uh, normally would produce a ground surface rupture. But for this earthquake, uh, maybe we had not found it yet, but um, we've tried and um, several teams are still scouring the place, but there's no surface trace uh, of any ground rupture. And that makes it uh, really more puzzling in the sense that uh, for, for a geologist or a seismologist, if the um, if, uh, when an earthquake produces a ground rupture, then the, the culprit fault is very easily pinpointed. But in this case, uh, there's no ground rupture, so that makes uh, gives us a challenge as far as um, uh, identifying which fault is concerned. And that's primarily the purpose, I think, of this presentation. Let's take a look at um, uh, where it took place. Um, this is uh, a map of that area, I think. Uh, I hope you are now familiar with uh, where Luzon is. That's the northernmost island, and we are on the left side or the western side of um, the island. Uh, let me just see if I can move that. No, I don't. I won't move that. Uh, so you hear is there's a focal mechanism solution um, from the Philippine Institute of Seismology and Volcanology. Uh, there were other um, institutions. Um, normally, almost automatically, you'd see a solution from GCMT, USGS, NEIC, um, uh, NEID in Japan, and Geoscope in France, and um, the Geophone in GFZ um, in Potsdam, Germany. Uh, but this one we chose, um, all of them, by the way, uh, have similar focal mechanism solutions. But for this presentation, we have chosen, I have chosen the solution by our local institute um, in cooperation with Japan, actually. And you see it um, is struggling a fault uh, called the Abra River Fault. The Abra River Fault is a branch of the Philippine Fault System. To the west of it, however, there's another fault, another branch of the Philippine Fault System we call the Viganagao Fault. So you see the um, epicenter of uh, that magnitude 7 earthquake is between those two uh, faults. Now, the distribution of the aftershocks, uh, this is about a week of aftershocks, ranging from magnitudes 4 to 5.5 or 5.6, uh, would show a northerly orientation, preferred orientation, uh, consistent with, um, with the nodal plane, the nodal plane in this um, uh, FMS that is striking roughly north-south, but it is dipping very gently to the east at about 30 degrees or even less. That's why in the models that um, I will be showing uh, in a while, uh, we will use that nodal plane to produce some uh, column stress transfer models to sort of um, look for the trace of the possible culprit and uh, the plane, uh, fault plane that produce the, the, the earthquake or created the earthquake. Before I go to that, uh, let me just mention that after the magnitude 7 earthquake, within a week's time, there were already about four um, aftershocks of significant magnitudes, more than 4.5. The strongest of them would be a 5.1 uh, on July 31st. Uh, now, this is a model quickly. We've run several models, of course, but uh, I'm just showing one or two of them. This is a model that uh, assumes that the magnitude 7 earthquake, the nodal plane, which is north-south trending, dipping gently to the east, as the source fault, and then a receiver fault, which here we assume to be one of the branches of the Philippine fault, which is a big and a fault, because that is what is consistent with what the dip of the nodal plane that we chose is. It could not be the Abra River fault itself because it would not anymore be consistent with the nodal plane that we chose. Uh, so you see the distribution of the stress. I, I hope everyone is familiar with the column stress transfer map. Uh, the red areas are those areas where stresses have transferred after the earthquake or accumulated, and the blue areas are those areas where stresses have decreased. Uh, and so um, if we run a cross-section, for example, sorry, uh, I'll show the cross-section later. Let me mention that, okay, um, this took place on July 27, magnitude 7 earthquake, but uh, 
less than three months after, on the 25th of, of October, uh, there was another earthquake of magnitude 6.4, which caused uh, significant damage as well. But this time on the northern uh, province of Ilocos, uh, most of the damage July, during the July earthquake were in the was in the province of Abra, we call that province Abra, but the 25 October earthquake of magnitude 6.4 uh, caused damage in um, the province north of Abra, which is called the Locos uh, region. Uh, that's the hometown of the current president of the Philippines. Um, and the distribution of the aftershocks, although there's uh, very few here, uh, moved to the north as well. And I'll show the significance of uh, why um, those aftershocks moved to the north uh, on the for the 25 October earthquake. Uh, I'm bringing back this slide to the left, uh, which you saw a while ago, which uh, shows the damage in Abra. But the, the image to the right is um, some some photographs show some photographs of the damage uh, infrastructure damage um, sustained by buildings in Ilocos region after the 25 uh, October earthquake. So you see very similar, although at the lower, perhaps lower. Um, um, degree of damage, but very similar, meaning you find there also a building uh, which uh, collapsed, the first floor of which totally collapsed. Uh, you see the sec in this photograph here, for example, the second floor already right on the ground. And very uh, common damage was a column shear, a vertical shear failures, uh, which were also seen in the Abra earthquake. Um, so, uh, if we try to take a look in more detail at uh, what may have happened during the two earthquakes, uh, I'll go back to this slide and and try to add some more by running cross sections along um, selected directions. So, for example, here you're looking at a cross section that goes from um, CC prime, which means uh, from north to south, um, C here is north and C prime is south. And you'd see the two earthquakes um, lying on the stress release areas. For those who are familiar perhaps with column stress modeling and know a little bit of earthquakes and seismology, this would suggest that the October 6, 25, 6, the magnitude 6.4 October 25 earthquake um, could well, could well um, uh, be categorized as an aftershock of the magnitude 7 earthquake July 27. But however, the magnitude is a little too strong. Uh, if we, if we um, take it in the context of the logarithmic relationship between the main shock and the up and aftershocks, the aftershocks are always uh, um, one magnitude, one degree of magnitude lower, at least the, the first uh, level of, of aftershock. But 6.4 is more than that. So we took a look further at the other aftershocks of the main um, magnitude 7 earthquake, and we see at least uh, three of them lying on the same stress release areas. So they could well qualify as aftershocks, although there's one right um, far into the south of the main, main shock, uh, magnitude 4.8, uh, lying on the stress increase areas, uh, we think that they, this might be a triggered earthquake, not related to uh, the main fault itself, perhaps um, activating a fault uh, somewhere down south, uh, still maybe a branch of the Philippine fault. Now, um, if so if we integrate, um, as I said, we've run several models, and if we integrate um, and we select uh, some best sort of best fitting models, I'm choosing here, for example, uh, two cross sections, run, one running along the, main, the magnitude 7 earthquake, the other one running along the, the magnitude 6.4 earthquake of October 25. And um, if we, we look at them in three dimensions, uh, they seem to suggest that there's a single fault that caused the, the two earthquakes, uh, if indeed the, the magnitude 6.4 is an aftershock of the magnitude 7 earthquake. And so we are looking at a fault that is uh, striking almost north-northeast, but bending a little bit to the northeast as you go to the to the to the further to the north. Now let me shift to a video. Uh, uh, I will request, um, I'll stop sharing the screen and move to another and share another another screen um, to show 
important. Uh, a an animation of um, of the area where um, we plotted the, the old available data, including the focal mechanism solutions, plotted on a um, topog top well, uh, 3D rendered topography. And uh, here, for example, that's the magnitude seven earthquake of July 27. This is the magnitude 6.4 of October 25, uh, aftershocks of the July 27, aftershocks of the magnitude 6.4 over here on a map. And if, if we see under, take a look underneath, you'd see that the magnitude seven uh, and the magnitude four earthquake would lie roughly on the same, uh, shall we say, earthquake aftershock zone or something like um, a, a plane that runs from the south to the north on a north, northeast to northeast trend. Uh, let me now unshare this one and go back to my main slide um, to explain a little bit what uh, I intend to mean by that. Uh, here you go. Uh, are you seeing um, my original PowerPoint slide? Yes, it looks great. Okay, thank you. So uh, to summarize the the figure, the um, um, block diagram I showed a while ago, and um, the interpretation now our interpretation is that the geometry the possible geometry of the fault that caused the two earthquakes and their aftershocks would run something like this uh, pardon me for the local names but that's how we call our faults this is the vegan vegan agao fault vegan is that um, historical city visited by tourists uh, year in and year out because um, many of the spanish uh, buildings heritage buildings are preserved in that city but uh, beside it is a fault called the Viganago fault. And then if you go further north, there's another fault. There are plenty of faults anyway, but uh, uh, we it appears that uh, it is connected with uh, at least for the two earthquakes during the last uh, three or four months. Uh, it appears that the Viganago fault is connected with the South Solsona fault and they form a roughly 50 kilometer long uh, so that's about what 30, 25 miles long, uh, a long strike fault, but it is dipping uh, gently to the east, contrary to uh, what we believe is the geometry of the Abra River Fault, which was earlier um, identified by uh, certain institutions as the culprit fault for this earthquake. So, um, what do we know about the geology of the place because somehow faults are are best understood when we have a good grasp of um, the geology meaning the stratigraphy rock sequences and the geomorpho geomorphology and all this so what we did is to sort of integrate our column stress transfer model with what we know underneath meaning the geology of the place and i'm showing here a cross section uh, i bring by the way my class uh, very often to this place uh, to show them uh, rock types and geologic structures and so on so what we know in that place is that um, underneath it is made up of mainly uh, volcanic terrain meaning intrusive rocks like uh, diorites more on towards the towards the um, intermediate type but also uh, a lot of uh, sedimentary rocks but in the place where we suspect the fault uh, has moved it is transect it transects the fault transects um, a package of sedimentary sequences and at the surface uh, we see indeed the uh, highly deformed folded uh, sequences i don't have uh, time i guess to show photographs of this but uh, as i said this is a place where we bring our students to show them geologic structures and so um, it is more likely and it is consistent with the distribution of the hypocenters of the aftershocks at least of the magnitude 7 earthquake that it is a, an east dipping fault uh, located if it were to rupture it would rupture further to the west not on the upper river fault which is believed to be steep, uh, very steeply dipping, uh, uh, as you see here in this drawing. 
Now, uh, what do we intend to do um, in the next uh, days, weeks, or months or so? Uh, we intend to take a look at uh, interferometry. However, I'm showing this uh, one, one, one um, article that has come out very recently, I think last month, by one of our, um, seven, uh, two of them are co-authors actually, graduates here at the university, but they're now pursuing uh, postgraduate or even um, postdoc um, uh, stints in Canada. Uh, one is in Mac MacMeister, I think, uh, Jer Jeremy Rimando, the main author. And the other one is uh, Slav Mendoza is now with UBC, uh, University of Vancouver, um, British Columbia in Vancouver. And they showed in that article that um, it is consistent with what we observe, meaning it it is not likely that it is the Upper River Fault here uh, with the acronym ARF, but rather a fault west of it. Um, and then they show they showed several models and uh, chosen the Viganagao. Uh, one, one of the options is the Viganagao Fault, just as uh, we also suspect. And then uh, another one is an Upper River Fault, but west of it, uh, well, west of the Upper River Fault. So here, as I said, although they, they admit that in this article, it is a very, it was very rapidly, the data was very rapidly processed and they, this, the, the authors of this article um, did not go to the field to provide sort of confirmatory uh, information for their models. And so what we intend to do now is to take a look uh, deeper into the available INSAR data, uh, the Sentinel data, and my colleague, John Dale, uh, will be working on it uh, soon. So thank you very much, everyone, and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Mario, for a very, uh, very technical presentation. I just have one quick question though. Most questions will be at the end, but that that area is most of the the Philippine population located on that island. Yeah. Okay. Um, of the one hundred ten or twelve million Filipinos, uh, about. I think the latest statistics would say about forty percent are in Metro Manila. So that's uh, 40 million uh, and surroundings. Metro Manila has about 15 million, roughly, officially, but uh, including, for example, the four provinces around it, you get easily can get easily 30 to 40 million Filipinos. But in okay. that area, in Abra, for example, it's yeah. not really thickly populated. First of all, it is a mountainous region. Uh, access, of course, is uh, through roads and, and uh, everything. But um, in general, um, it is sparsely populated compared, relatively speaking. And when you say sparse in the Philippines, it's still in the order of millions of uh, people. Okay. But um, okay. compared to Metro Manila, it's less populated. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I would like now to introduce our second speaker, and that's Dr. Lissandro Garciano. He is a professor of civil engineering at De La Salle University. He is also a director of the Association of Structural engineers of the Philippines. He will report on observed building damage. Gigi, could you please proceed? Thank you, Bruce. So good evening, everyone from uh, California. Uh, I'll present the observed damages during the last uh, July 27, 22 magnitude earthquake, Northwestern Luzon, Philippines earthquake. I would just like to uh, also to uh, to acknowledge the uh, the team because we sent uh, a study team after just a few days after the earthquake. So basically, the outline of the presentation. I would just talk uh, about the uh, ASEP Dumper Study Team. ASEP means the Association of Structural Engineers of the Philippines, and Dumper is a uh, disaster mitigation. Uh, 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 Disaster mitigation and uh, preparedness and response uh, team, and then some observed damages. Uh, it was widespread, but we were able to at least go uh, look at houses, schools, hospitals, roads and bridges, heritage structures, and churches. And then a little bit of summary. So briefly, ASEP, uh, Association of Structural Engineers of the Philippines, we uh, we organized this DMPR. Uh, disaster Mitigation Preparedness and Response uh, a group 
uh, after the Bohol 2013 earthquakes because there was a need to assist our local governments, especially in terms of uh, as quickly, rapidly assessing damage due to not only earthquakes, but as well as other hazards. So this is our organizational chart. I am part of the training and research group, and I usually uh, go with a study team. So we send the dumper team ahead as first responders. And then we have a second group, which is the asset study team that, that uh, tries to study and learn from uh, the, the effect, the damages caused by uh, this hazard, especially earthquake and strong typhoons. So these are, these are the asset dumper study team mobilizations in the past. Uh, 2013, we had a 7.2 magnitude earthquake in Bohol, which damaged a lot of heritage structures. And this awakened the Philippines that the need to, uh, to study, preserve, retrofit our historical structures. And then in 2019, we had earthquakes, one in the north, uh, Pampanga, a uh, 6.1 magnitude earthquake in Pora and the series of earthquakes in Cotabato in the south. We had 6.3, 6.6, 6.1 earthquakes, and we also sent teams. And the, the, uh, the super typhoon uh, Rai, international code name Rai, or ODEC in, uh, in the local scene, in 2021, we also sent a, a team, but not only ASEP, but as well as other, uh, other uh, organizations to inspect specifically uh, the heritage structures that were damaged in the southern part of, of the country. So we have been doing this. This is our uh, advocacy in ASEP that we send uh, teams, especially after a damaging uh, natural uh, hazard like earthquakes and uh, typhoons. So when uh, the, the earthquake struck in July, uh, we immediately sent our dumper team because we have we divided, we are divided into three area so that mobilization is fast. So this, uh, this uh, six uh, engineers from the north were dispatched to spe uh, especially help our LGU, the local government units, in rapidly ass assessing structures which are uh, heavily damaged, specifically heavily damaged, so that they will be able to respond right away. So this, uh, these were our six engineers who responded and uh, were quickly mobilized. After that, we also sent our study team a few days later. Uh, and also you can see on the screen, uh, some of the members during a, a photo shoot of uh, the, an important structure, which is the Bantai Tower. And we were able to, uh, to take a look at this structure and uh, quickly assess if, uh, if it need, needs to be uh, retrofitted quickly or to do some uh, uh, quick uh, intervention. As for the study team, we it took us uh, we took about three days to to uh, go around uh, Vigan, which is the heritage. Uh, it's a it's a it's a world heritage site, uh, Vigan, on the western side of, of uh, Ilocos. And then we went to Abra uh, because uh, we had to we had to look at some structures, bridges uh, that were uh, that the local government uh, requested us to 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 investigate to assess. So day one was in the World Heritage site, but because we arrived there a little bit later in the afternoon, we had to go back the following day. Uh, we went to Bantai Tower, which is just adjacent to uh, Bigan. And then uh, we went to Abra and uh, uh, saw the, the houses uh, damaged as well as one, one bridge. And then uh, the, the Day three, when we were about to leave, we also looked at some uh, other earthquake-induced uh, phenomena like sand boils, uh, ground fissures, and, uh, and landslides. And then on the way, Santa Maria Church, uh, going back to Manila, uh, we were able to drop by Santa Maria Church just to, to, uh, to see because uh, we were asked by the local uh, parish to take a look at the, the church. So for the houses, uh, we got this from uh, the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management uh, Group. And these were the uh, tally of the damage to houses. Most of them are low, low rise uh, structure, residential houses, two to three uh, stories. So for a three, 
uh, three-story residential building with a roof deck, you can see here a soft story failure. And uh, the, the stories above the ground floor were a bit, bit heavy, top heavy. And so when the ground shaking occurred, it just uh, collapsed. And uh, luckily, uh, no one was, uh, was injured or killed during this event. We, we can see here a, uh, a car that was, uh, that was compressed by the second floor. And also damage to masonry walls. And uh, you can also see here uh, the in the, the, the column and uh, the, there's some kind of a compression failure in the in the column, as well as uh, yeah another view of the of the structure that was uh, that had the soft story failure. And here you can see the columns which uh, they they did not follow the code requirements in terms of confining the concrete spacing of the of the uh, of the lateral uh, lateral reinforcement, so that when the strong strong shaking occurred, the it just burst and you have uh, you have buckling of the vertical reinforcements. So we have detailing problems. We have inadequate reinforcement. This is a two-story residential building in Abra. So we all, we often see this during uh, strong earthquakes in Bohol, in uh, Surigao, in Pora, and also in uh, this uh, latest uh, earthquake in, in the, the July 2022 earthquake mm -hmm. in Abra. And again, uh, failure may be attributed to the under design of, of members so we have we, we say non-engineered uh, buildings or, 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 uh, or houses and also some problems in terms of extending extending in this case they extended a beam to another two-story house so without any uh, without any detailed calculations and so when the earthquake happened, you can see here uh, the failure in the, in the, in the beams, in, in columns. And some short column effect. When we put walls in columns, the, the, the performance of the column changes. It, it will uh, show a uh, short column effect and the, the failure will be different, sheer failure. So also, in the screen, you can see detailing deficiencies in terms of uh, confining the, the vertical or the column. And other uh, small residential houses, especially those uh, uh, masonry walls that are not supported laterally. So tendencies is that it will just uh, it will just collapse when it is uh, when it's loaded in its outer plane in the outer plane. Uh, uh, of the wall, so it will it will just collapse without any lateral uh, stiffener. For hospitals and schools uh, in Ilocosur, uh, in uh, in a memorial hospital, we were able to see cracks in columns as well as falling of concrete. You can see in the screen, and uh, you have here also very common to all uh, to all. Uh, damage, uh, you have spalling of concrete as well. You see lots of cracks, especially on the unreinforced masonry that I'll show later. This one is the, uh, the high school in, in, in Locosur, and you can see also same cracks and beam column connection failures also. Here we were able to see some settlement of the corridor. So the, the ground just settled adjacent to uh, maybe the corridor and so it uh, had some uh, it will have a problem in terms of uh, access later on and some minor and major cuts for buildings uh, we 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 again saw spalling of concrete uh, damaged masonry walls and there was one in uh, in abra where the the building just uh, leaned on one side it was very dangerous and so uh, you can see here, I think the same slide with uh, Dr. Mario earlier, and uh, 
Mm. And yeah, the building just mm. leaning one side. There were, I think there were three buildings in the, that were uh, mm. with the same owner. And mm. two of those buildings uh, exhibited failure. Mm. This is a three-story commercial building with a roof And this one is the adjacent uh, building made of steel. But again, the second floor was quite heavy. So it was not able to resist the strong ground shaking. And you can see here failure in the in the uh, the columns it just lean to one side. And here you can see a, a two-story commercial building and uh, your buckling of the vertical uh, reinforcement, loss of confinement, and you see inadequate reinforcement. So uh, really detailing is very important, especially when we have uh, extreme, uh, extreme loads such as earthquakes. For roads and uh, for for roads and bridges, uh, what, what we were able to observe was the uh, Calaba Bridge in Abra, and uh, one of our uh, team members uh, uh, went underneath the the bridge and saw the the pads that were uh, displaced. So you can see in the middle of the screen the bearing pad that was displaced, and also the uh, expansion joint. It, I think it measured about four inches, moved about four inches. And you can see on one side of the, the bridge uh, cracks in terms of the, the support, uh, uh, supporting uh, elements. And in other areas, we see se uh, separation of the roads. That's why you can see the screen. Uh, workers from the Department of Public Works and Highways uh, quickly uh, fixing the roads to make it possible. And also there were slides, landslides, uh, rock slides uh, in some parts uh, that making a, the road a bit uh, hazardous, so they have to uh, put some barriers. For churches and heritage, we spent a, uh, uh, a certain amount of time here because uh, there's, there are lots of, uh, lot of structures in this uh, World Heritage Site. And uh, the local government also uh, because we always tie up with the local government, uh, gave us some instructions to stay a bit longer here at uh, the World Heritage Site. And you can see here a, an unreinforced masonry that was structured, that was converted into a two-story mall, sort of, sort of a, a mall. And a lot of the, the plaster uh, on the URM were, uh, fell off after the earthquake. So you can see here cracks, and you can see the bricks that were exposed. And uh, I'll just go quickly through the pictures. And uh, here we have the the Arzobispado, in which the, one of the columns were, I think, were uh, pushed by the by a very stiff wall, so that you can see that that uh, only two columns exhibited failure only because these were these were where the, the stiff walls were uh, located. And so when it moved, it pushed the, the two columns. So this is the, uh, yeah, again, the Arzobispado. And, uh, and the cathedral, the vegan cathedral that was uh, heavily damaged. You can see the facade where the, uh, the uh, plaster of the URM fell off to the, to the entrance. And this is a uh, close-up view. And uh, we were able to bring drones during the during the investigation, so we were able to capture the the damage on top of the, the cathedral. This is a top view of the entrance, and you can see the separation in the the the, facade, the main facade. So here, there is it's separated. You can see it from the from the uh, top view, and debris uh, fell into the into the entrance of the church. And uh, yes, you can see damage on the upper portion of the, of the cathedral. And uh, we were able to at least capture this uh, with, the, with drone shots. Inside the cathedral, at the, near the choir loft, we can also see uh, damage. So the choir loft is uh, this one. You can see that the bricks fell off from the, from the arch. And we had to uh, instruct the LGU to cordon the area because of uh, possible falling debris if there are aftershocks uh, later. The big clock tower, uh, 
did not exhibit a lot of damage, but uh, you can see already uh, cracks uh, emanating from almost everywhere. So when we went to the to vegan, uh, the LGU gave us a list of what to uh, what uh, structures to to investigate to to assess, and uh, and then we, we we tried to complete all of those. Although there were so many that uh, probably we only finished about half of it during our stay. This is the again the the vegan clock tower. And other structures within the, I just noted it as the vegan world heritage sites because uh, this is a tourist spot and you, know, you see a lot of tourists uh, in this area uh, uh, visiting. Uh, and so, and th these are low story houses made of URM. And a lot of them, most of them, uh, suffered damage, minor to, to major damage. This one, you can see it, uh, the plaster fell off. And uh, the the bricks were the bricks were uh, were seen. This another picture, another photo. Some more photos, and this uh, the Kima home uh, house in uh, Vegan. This, this is an important structure uh, made of combination of uh, URM and, and timber. So we were able to visit it, and you see there's uh, on the right side of your screen, the facade already fell off during the, the ground shaking. So they had to cover it and uh, uh, reinforce it so that it will not uh, collapse, at, uh, the other facades will not collapse. So more cracks in the interior of the house. And this is our team that inspected it. And then we went to uh, San Agustin Church, uh, and uh, we were able to see a horizontal crop emanating from, or uh, showing from the from end to end, almost end to end of the church. And uh, when we, and also a vertical crop. And then when we went outside, we we saw this uh, these uh, bricks that fell off. So this is the Saint Augustine Church. And finally, the, the Pantai Tower. And uh, you might have seen this in, in the videos uh, uploaded on YouTube, that this, this tower uh, vigorously or say dangerously uh, was shaking during the earthquake. And this is the before the earthquake, and now you can see it after the earthquake. A lot of uh, the bricks fell off. And uh, and you see the debris all around the tower. And then what is dangerous was that there were residences uh, at the back of the tower. Okay. So more photos. And finally, going back to Manila, we passed by uh, Santa Maria Church. But uh, the only damage that we saw here was the uh, this crack on the on the main in the at the back of the, the church. You can see in the right side of your screen, there's a crack, but otherwise the church survived the earthquake. It's quite far from, from Digan and other. The crack you can see on the left side of your screen. And, uh, and other earthquake-induced phenomena, uh, we also saw ground fissure and sun boils. Uh, this is just about 10 minutes from, from Digan. And we were able to get some samples uh, and took them back to the, the university. So just to wrap up, uh, as a summary, uh, ASEP, we send the DMPR and study teams, especially during uh, the disasters. Okay. And one of this was uh, during the magnitude 7 northwest Western Luzon, Philippines earthquake. We were able to observe damage to structures, hospitals, schools, bridges, heritage, structures as well as churches and other earthquake induced phenomena such as sun boils, ground fissures and landslides. And so with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Lissandro, for a very informative um, description of damage. I have a pretty good feel for the types of damage that you suffered. 
Our time is moving along rapidly. I'm going to turn control over to Vulcan for the question and answer period, but it looks like we might run over a little bit today uh, with regard to the audience, just to let them know maybe five, perhaps 10 minutes. Vulcan, could you please proceed? Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Gigi. Uh, my first question, without losing any time, would be for Mario. Um, in the article that you published at Tumblr, I saw that there are uh, low-cost seismometers that you deployed. Tell us about that experience. Were you able to get uh, some data out of that, and what was your experience? Yeah, I think uh, thank you, Vulcan, for that question, and I think you're referring to the Raspberry Shake um, mm -hmm. seismometers, which is uh, commonly used now by what we call citizen scientists. Yes, um, we gathered the information with respect, for example, to location, um, magnitude, hypocentral depth, distance from our stations. But um, as far as the modeling, as I showed, for example, the column stress modeling, we um, did not make use of any information coming out from those size, uh, seismometers. Um, Certainly, of course, uh, but we have now an ongoing project on trying to look at the possibility of also extracting information from those seismometer, seismometers um, to eventually maybe useful in, in the type of work we do, like uh, column stress transfer modeling. But for now, uh, Volcan, no, um, we did not get information from those seismometers for our modeling purposes. Yeah. Maybe this could be a little bit of a suggestion. I don't know if you have conducted like a double difference relocation or waveform um, cross correlation or match filter. You might be able to get these earthquakes a little bit um, more tightly. Uh, That's right. Relocated. Relocated. relocated yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that could potentially help your you know hypothesis of where the uh, fault is. And, That's right. And there was one question about. Um, whether or not you are planning on doing conducting more trenches to find out the, um, I guess, um, previous ruptures for that assumed fault. Yeah, um, we even before the earthquake um, of July 27, I was already leading a team uh, further north in the we call the um, Solsona Basin uh, to look for possible sites for trenching. Uh, we've done trenching in Bohol, for example, in 2013 earthquake, and we have published papers for that. Uh, but we were not able to look for um, appropriate sites for trenching in the mm -hmm. north, because what you need in a trench is uh, some datable material. You see organic matter and everything. That area is very mountainous. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, it should be um, a work um, that we should think about in the future. Uh, hopefully, there will be no earthquakes yet. <laughs> Big earthquakes yet, but uh, yes, uh, trenching and relocation of earthquakes uh, together with INSAR interpretation, we are working on those. There are also now deep learning uh, type um, earthquake locators as well. So it's not just yeah. match filter, but there's also machine learning, deep learning type algorithms that you can potentially use. Yeah, thank you for the no suggestion. Problem. I'll get in touch with you, by the way, in soon. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Gigi, um, my question to you would be, um, you have shown a lot of damages, but you haven't really told us what was the shaking uh, observed or estimated to be observed on those locations, whether or not also, uh, did you have a sense that this damage was more or less than expected for the area and whether or not this would um, be um representative of the general vulnerability of the country as a whole or this is a particularly maybe more vulnerable areas what would you like to say that uh yeah thank you for the question Volka. uh yeah. if you notice uh the structures that were damaged were most of them especially in the heritage uh, area in Digan, mm -hmm. and these are uh these are unreinforced masonry and not designed for strong ground shaking there were buildings actually along the way when we went to, to vegan uh, that were not damaged. So we also look we also look into structures that were not damaged and performed well during this earthquake. And I think uh, the, the most important part here is uh, following the code. We have the national structure called the Philippines, and uh, which gives minimum, uh, especially guidance for earthquake uh, for earthquake design. 
And uh, we have seen in the, in the, the photos, uh, you can see there uh, in, in accurate, uh, no, in, uh, deficient uh, reinforcement and buckling, fa buckling failure and so on. So I think uh, performance would be better if we really follow the code and, uh, and even better than the code. So what do you like to say for the uh, newer structures, for example, the ones that's been built after uh, 2010, for example, would that would they uh, perform in slightly better than what you are seeing in the yes uh, yes 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 they would perform I think yeah better than uh, what we have seen. When was the main uh, code change in the Philippines? You know, when was the in in every country after major earthquakes, code would get a little bit more stringent. Uh, do you have a date like that in the Philippines that you would expect buildings to perform much better than uh, older buildings? Yeah, actually, we have we are we have convened a uh, the code committee, and we are going to hopefully we are going to uh, as we are speaking the the committee is uh, is having a workshop, and hopefully we'll be able to to produce or to uh, yeah to print the twenty the eighth edition of the we call the National Structural Code of the Philippines. The code that we are using now is the twenty fifteen NSCP, and uh, hopefully we'll have the eighth edition or the twenty twenty three. Uh, code provisions that will shift from now we have uh, we have uh, two zones earthquake zones but we are shifting towards uh, same as ASC 705 we have contour uh, spectral assimilation it's fantastic so um, Bruce if you have any questions I would like to um, turn the microphone to you also um, no, bearing with the time, time. Yeah, I have a, a lot you. of questions, but uh, this is for Gigi. Uh, my compliments. It looks like your um, post earthquake evaluation teams are, are quite effective or, or well organized. But the question I have is this: In the United States, we have something where we tag. We say we tag a building. Hmm. We assign a placard. It could be red, yellow, or green. And do you do anything like that in the Philippines? Yes, we definitely we are following that uh, that uh, procedure. So, with the assistance of the local government units, they're the ones who put those uh, plaques, whether it, the placard, whether it is safe, it is uh, restricted. So, same color coding that we use. In okay, so we, in our country, we say it's a, like an ATC twenty type thing. Hey, do you have you heard yes. that expression? Yes, yes, yes. Same. Okay, very good, very good. Now, the buildings you've shown, they look like they're masonry. Uh, and soft story problems. And, uh, but uh, are, is there much wood construction? It just seems to me that would that performs better. And and you, you didn't talk about this in as much as so there was m less damage or not notable damage in those types of structures. Yeah, it's most common. of the yeah, most of the structures that we saw that were damaged were actually uh, URM as well as uh, reinforced concrete structures, uh, soft story mechanism thing. But other, we didn't see much of timber structures that, that failed during. Is, our, is that because is that because timber structures are in the minority, or or, or just because they they weren't damaged? Uh, it has more become a minority. Normally, we have a reinforced concrete uh, okay. first floor, and then timber the, the second floor. But usually now we have RC structures. Okay, okay. Now with regard to the, is the issue uh. Uh, that the codes aren't being followed, or is it just that the buildings you've shown were constructed under earlier codes? In other words, is it because the code was not followed, or is it just because the older code did not have this seismic detailing? Uh, actually, the 2010, we have, before 2015, we had a 2010 uh, code, but it already contains uh, earthquake provisions. We just updated. But I think oh, it's kind of a tricky, I think, problem because uh, if you, you can design it, but the the uh, construction will also might be a problem if they don't follow what's being designed. So it's okay. really difficult to pinpoint until this uh, failure will, will you can see them after an earthquake. Okay, good. Do you have more questions? Uh, if not, I have a few more. I I have one one question. Go ahead. Um, I wonder. The, the reason for preference of RC buildings or URM buildings, is that like a climate related? Because, you know, those buildings tend to perform better in the wind 
kind of situations, right? Like hurricanes and typhoons. Uh, yes, we especially for our reinforced concrete uh, structures. Although we are we are moving also towards sustainable construction like bamboo, mm. and oh, we are yeah. we are uh, hopefully we are going to include in our code uh, structural bamboo. That's and fantastic. So are there are there any um, practices in place where um, after certain magnitude you need to go out and inspect buildings, or every researcher does that on their own? Are there any like a minimum, let's say, magnitude or maximum earthquake that you need to definitely look at all the buildings? Do you have anything like that? Well, usually magnitude is greater than five or six. And uh, well, well, what what triggers our uh, site visit normally would be from the LGU. That hmm. would be the dumper team. But for ASEP, uh, we have a study team that can go there even without a trigger from the LGU. So if, if we think it's necessary for our for our code, we send a team. I need to ask one one final question. What would you need from the international community to help you out or collaborate with you in terms of you know any 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 kind? Because you know we are reaching out to a lot of people who are conducting similar kind of uh, business as you are. Um, this could be a right time to potentially. Um, make some um, research arrangements or some kind of assistance arrangements. So do you have anything like that in mind? This yes, is for thank, both you for of the, both of you. thank you for that question, Volkan. We are open to collaborations. ASEP is uh, open to collaboration, research. Uh, you, you can even do a joint inspection if you can send your teams here. And uh, it would be good because uh, it, it, it will be two in that case, uh, we will learn from, from ERI. We are learning from each other. That's that's the that's the purpose of this series. Mario, do you have any any uh, research idea, collaboration idea that you have in mind? Yes, as I said, uh, Volcan, I'll be getting in touch with you soon, especially for uh, a continued uh, effort on trying to pinpoint the culprit fault for these two earthquakes. It's not only one but two. Uh, yeah, so we are go going to pursue that. But uh, at the same time, of course, um, our, we, we, I hate to say, use this expression, our hands are full yes, yes, <laughs> in terms yes, of right. earthquakes, not only in Luzon, uh, plenty of them are occurring in the south, in Mindanao, for example. Yeah. Uh, you've heard perhaps of the 2019, four big earthquakes in 2019 in the span of two months. So, um, yeah. Uh, A lot of opportunity. We need, we need help. We need help. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes. Um, then I think this would conclude the question and uh, answer um, part. We are immensely grateful for your generosity in terms of the information that you have uh, shared with us. And I, I cannot thank you enough for this uh, opportunity. And for yes. the final remarks, maybe uh, Elizabeth would like to take it away. Yeah, let me just mention, sorry, Volcan. Sure. I, I've been, um, there have been questions in the Q&A box and I've been answering them directly because, um, yeah, so I thought that there would be no time anymore to discuss them live. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Thank you both to our, our wonderful speakers and to everybody who's joined us today. Um, if you're still with us, uh, there will be a post-webinar survey that will pop up in your browser uh, when the Zoom ends shortly. So if you have a moment, we'd really appreciate if you could fill that out. That helps us uh, you know, make sure our programming is the best possible stuff to meet the interests of our audience. And a version of that will also be sent by email tomorrow. So if you don't get to it today, you need to run. Uh, if you can give us a moment to fill it out tomorrow, that would be great. As I mentioned before, you can learn more about ERI and join us at the website and see the most recent edition of our newsletter there. And then finally, I just want to thank FEMA and also ERI's members for the funding that makes this series and other webinars and events possible. So thank you for another great event. And I guess we'll see you next year for the 2023 Quick Quake Briefing Series.